then some water that you wouldn't notice because there was water in the first place. One thing that you should be mindful of is that they tell you how much sulfuric acid to use, right? So you're not sure if you have too much. You're not sure if you have just enough. What you're doing basically in the lab is just following the procedure, right? If they tell you to use, um, say, 10 milliliters, then you use 10 milliliters. But what if you didn't need all 10 milliliters, right? What if you only needed, say, 6 milliliters? Then you might have some leftover sulfuric acid, right? Aqueous. And here's the deal, you guys, you wouldn't see it, right? Because it's also clear and colorless. So then the important thing to note about this is that it's there, even though you don't see it. And so in the next step, the final step of that reaction, where you would take the copper to sulfate, and you're hoping to precipitate solid copper by adding some solid magnesium, right? But here's the deal. If you have left over sulfuric acid, another step can happen. Another sort of side step or a byproduct can form, right? So if I were to just do this precipitation reaction, the single replacement reaction, I get magnesium sulfate in the aqueous phase, clear and colorless, right? It looks like a glass of water and then the solid copper. And that's that sort of soggy bran, like the raisin bran, right? So you're trying to get that copper back. And then at the end, you would have measured, you know, you dry it off and then you, you get the mass and you try to recover all of your, um, your magnesium, or I'm sorry, your copper. But what if there was leftover sulfuric acid? then all of a sudden you're going to produce magnesium sulfate, which totally fine, right? Because that was one of the products that you were trying to make in the first place, but also hydrogen gas. This right here, this accounts for those bubbles. So it had nothing to do <clears throat> With the copper, right, it had everything to do with leftover sulfuric acid in your flask that you didn't know was there and you couldn't see it, right, because it's clear and colorless. It's just, a, you know, a solution, clear and colorless. You don't, you don't know it's there, um, but it's still in there, right, because in this particular experiment, we don't tell you to decant anything because you can't, right? The copper 2 sulfate is in solution, if you go pouring anything down the drain, you're pouring all your copper away. So we couldn't do anything about that. What we do instead is say, go ahead and add the magnesium. And those bubbles are a side reaction occurring between the magnesium metal and the sulfuric acid. And the hydrogen gas is the little bubbles. This is a gas evolving reaction, right? An example of a gas evolving reaction. What about if you're, so this is one of those situations where you're trying, you know, you're not trying to make a gas on purpose. It's just sort of like a, a side reaction. What if you are, right? What if you are trying to make a product that would be a gas? Like for example, if I were to take some sodium carbonate and we'll put this in solution. Now, if you guys are thinking of antacids like Tums, this would be calcium carbonate, right? So calcium, two plus and the carbonate anion is two minus, right? But we can do it with sodium, it's fine. What if I add some dilute hydrochloric acid to this mix? I'm just gonna balance this as I go because I already see that I have two sodium and I know I'm gonna be making some salt. I'm making this salt actually, and this will be in solution, right? but you also get carbonic acid. And this stuff 
right? Can react with itself, and I'll show you how in a sec, to produce CO2, which is a gas at room temperature, and water, which you wouldn't see because the whole thing is aqueous. What you would see if you took sodium carbonate in solution, so some aqueous solution of sodium carbonate, and you allowed it to be mixed with an aqueous solution, so like dilute hydrochloric acid, what you would see would be no color change, but instead it would look like um, Sprite, right? Or 7-Up, some clear, colorless, bubbly solution. That bubbly stuff is CO2 escaping from the reaction mixture. And what happened? Well, what happened was if we were to take carbonic acid, I'm going to expand this structure, and no, you don't have to memorize this or regurgitate it. I'm just thinking possibly somebody might be curious. What I'm going to do, because we do know how to draw Lewis structures, right? There's carbonic acid. So this is going to come over, and I guess this can happen from either side. I'm just going to pick a side. This can attack its own self. That oxygen is going to steal that hydrogen, and we're going to put the electrons on that oxygen. This, by the way, is going to take me so much longer to draw than it actually does take for this to happen. This is like an almost immediate thing. If you were to pour these two aqueous solutions together, um, you would see the bubbles immediately. So, right, so see that water molecule just die in a leave over there? What if I were to take these electrons and share them here and kick that off? Then what do I get? Carbon dioxide and water. This right here is your gas. So how did you get the carbonic acid in the first place? Well, this right here looks like this. in solution. The carbonate anion, right, both of those oxygens have a negative one charge. I'm going to add two equivalents of that acid. I'm going to protonate both of those oxygens and I get carbonic acid. But that carbonic acid can mess around with its own self, right? So we can rearrange that molecule and we can eliminate water and carbon dioxide. And it happens in like a nanosecond. So it's one of those situations where you take, you know, a Tums, you're essentially pouring some carbonate anion down the chute, and it's going to react with the excess acid in your stomach, and then a big burp comes, and it's the CO2. Usually burns your nose, right? Carbon, carbon dioxide um, can be slightly acidic. Well, how do we know that? Well, it's in dynamic equilibrium with carbonic acid. Also, just a little bit of trivia for your day. If um, your dentist tells you not to drink soda because it's bad for your teeth, it's unlikely just because of the sugar carbonated beverages in general, even seltzer, like sugar-free seltzer, is considered to be um, bad for your teeth. And why is that? So bacteria actually eat sugar and their waste product is acidic. It's the acid that erodes the enamel on your teeth. So if you're putting a carbonated beverage, even if it's sugar-free, down in, you know, if you're ingesting something carbonated like that, you're washing an acid solution over your teeth in the first place. So um, yeah, anyways, acid-base chemistry, gas-evolving reactions, they kind of go together. So there's another example. No, you don't have to give the mechanism for this organic reaction. I'm just showing this to you because you might have been curious. Somebody's probably wondering, why do I burp when I take a Tums, but I don't burp when I take a Rolaids? Guess what? Rolaids is hydroxide, magnesium or aluminum hydroxide. No CO2 comes out of that. So no burp. All right. I'm going to move on, <laughs> and we're going to cover the last piece of Chapter 8, and that's going to be the um, oxidation uh, reduction reactions, otherwise known as redox reactions.
In redox reactions, um, we talked about this in, in chapter seven a little bit. So in a redox reaction, we notice that there's a species in the pot that gains electrons and there's a species in the pot that loses electrons. And so these two processes happen at the same time in the same reaction flask. And so we put these two words together and we just call it a redox reaction, you know, a reduction oxidation or an oxidation reduction. So redox reactions happen when you've got two, at least two reactants in the pot. One of them is going to lose electrons to the other. When you get oxidized, you lose electrons. So if I lose my electrons to somebody else, they gain electrons, they get reduced. So reduction is a gain of electrons and oxidation is a loss of electrons. They have to happen simultaneously, right, for this process to go. So uh, there's a couple of silly little uh, phrases that you may have heard in high school to help remember um, what oxidation is and what reduction is. One of them is um, Leo the lion goes grr. <laughs> Let me write that down. So Leo, loss of electrons is oxidation. Leo goes grr, gain electrons is reduction. Every time I say this to classes these days, they look at me like I've got five heads um, because they learned oil rig instead, which is totally fine. So oil rig, O-I-L, oxidation is loss, R-I-G, reduction is gain. Whatever you need to do to remember it, just do it and you're good to go, <laughs> right? So you lose electrons, you get oxidized, you gain electrons, you get reduced. So for example, what does that look like though? So a nice easy way to tell, um, and I'm gonna go through just some general rules for recognizing the oxidation states um, in a particular species. And oxidation states, calculating these things, or even just kind of quickly figuring them out, all it is is just an accounting method for um, keeping track of where the electrons went if they went anywhere, right? It helps you to predict if a redox reaction has actually occurred because they aren't always gonna be super obvious, right? So with ions, so if you've got a charge on something, it's easy to see. Like if on one side of the reaction equation, something has a charge and then on the other side it doesn't, it either gained or lost electrons. And so that's nice and easy to spot. But sometimes we have molecules where there is no charge and you're like, what happened? So in that molecule, that molecule is made up of atoms and those individual atoms could have had a change in their oxidation state, their electron environment. So it's really great if we figure out a way um, to figure those out so that we can tell if a redox reaction actually occurred when we're not staring at obviously charged species. But to give nice, easy example for an oxidation, um, I could take, for example, um, say copper. I'm going to leave off the physical states right now, but suffice it to say copper zero. So oxidation state of zero. It's got all of its electrons. It doesn't have anybody else's, right? Um, will be a solid in an aqueous solution. We know that copper metal is not soluble in water, right? Um, but I can have this in equilibrium with copper two plus. These ions would be, by the way, in solution. So that would be aqueous if we were in, an, in a water, a solution, you know, where water is a solvent. But we have to add on to the other side two electrons. Because check that out. Look at that arrow. If I go from left to right, right? So copper, zero, has all of its electrons. I move over to the right. See that product, copper two plus? It has lost two electrons. If I were to look from right to left and I say copper two plus plus two electrons, now see that little arrow underneath? That's going backward. That's saying copper two plus is gaining electrons and it's going backward, right, to copper zero. Copper going to copper two plus is the oxidation. The reverse reaction is the reduction. So I can write something different over here, like down here. I can say if I want to do a reduction, I write this backward. Because remember, we write our reaction equations from left to right by convention. But this little arrow tells you I can go either way. Left to right on the top there is an oxidation. I'm losing electrons, right? The copper is losing electrons. 
But if I were to write it backward and still use that same arrow because this process can go either way, right? And we'll talk about when, you know, in a sec. Zinc 2 plus, plus two electrons going to zinc zero, that's a reduction. Zinc 2 plus got reduced. It gained electrons. So you can write them either way. Just to let you know, your textbook is going to give you something called the activity series. Um, and they're trying to impress upon you the what they call reactivity of these metals. And it's basically listing how easily, like from top to bottom, um, how easily a species can gain or lose electrons. The activity series in your book speaks to the oxid oxidation, right? So it's going to be like copper going from left to right to copper two plus. So how easy a species will lose electrons or how readily something will be oxidized. That's the activity series. And it tells you basically they're going to call that how reactive it is. But you can really only make a qualitative assessment on the spontaneity of a redox reaction based on the activity series. You cannot quantify anything with just simply, yeah, this is more reactive than this in terms of being oxidized. The data that we obtain, like actual data in the lab, speaks to the reduction or the reduction potential, the power to be reduced. So very often when you look up in um, reduction potential tables or standard reduction potential tables, you'll find um, that all of these little reactions are going to be reductions. And so you're going to be given voltages associated with the power of that species to gain electrons. And we're going to make use of that in Chem 32. And I'm going to give you just sort of a little appetizer for it at the end of this lecture. We'll do a couple of calculations and predict whether or not um, a redox reaction will be spontaneous. And spontaneous for us means this thing is going to occur naturally, as in on its own, without our help or without the help of some outside source of electrons. So let's move on and just quickly go through a few guidelines. Um, we're going to be assigning oxidation states, or in other words, oxidation numbers, to certain species. And there's some really handy rules that we can sort of follow to make it um, a little bit easier on us when we're trying to figure out, hey man, did a redox reaction actually occur? You know, it's not always gonna be easy to see. Not everything has a charge. When it does, it's real easy to tell, but when it doesn't, you have to figure out the oxidation state. In other words, the electron environment around the species on the reactant side and on the product side, and you decide, did the oxidation state change? If the answer is no for all of the species involved, then it's not a redox reaction. If the oxidation state changed for any of the species involved in the reaction, from reactant side to product side, then yeah, a redox reaction did occur. So let's start out with a few guidelines. The first one is pretty simple. The oxidation state of any atom in a free element is zero. What am I talking about? Well, remember up there where I was saying copper, plain old solid copper, right? The oxidation state is zero. So anything really, you could say like gold, for example, plain old solid gold. The oxidation state for that is zero. There's no charge on that species, right? The oxidation state of any atom in its free element is zero. How about number two? The oxidation state of any monoatomic ion is equal to its charge. This is where it's nice and sweet. When you have a nice, simple reaction where something is charged on the reactant side and it's not charged on the product side, it's like, okay, yep. I either gained or lost electrons and I can tell, did I, you know, take a cation, right, and reduce it by giving it electrons and make it zero on the other side? It's pretty easy to see. So for example, I could take like the ferric ion. The oxidation state of the iron in the ferric ion is positive three. Likewise, I could take an anion, right? So I could take uh, like sulfide. So sulfur with a negative two charge. The oxidation state of the sulfur in that anion is negative two. And there are some, um, some elements that are pretty easy to count on. 
Um, hydrogen and oxygen are, are two of those. Hydrogen very often has a um, positive one oxidation state. And the only time it doesn't is um, if it's bonded to itself or if it's bonded to a more electro, I'm sorry, a less an electronegative element. Um, oxygen, unless it's bonded to itself, typically takes on a negative two oxidation state. And it's nice to have those that you can count on because when we're calculating the oxidation state for other atoms in a molecule, if you have, like for example, carbon dioxide and you have an oxygen in there, you can say oxygen typically is in the negative two oxidation state and then go ahead and calculate the oxidation state for the carbon. So there's gonna be a nice little sort of um, algebraic expression that we can use to figure that out. Um, but the next guideline um, is nice and handy. So when you want to figure out the oxidation state for the individual species in a molecule or a polyatomic ion, the sum of all of the oxidation states, right, all of the atoms involved in that species have their own oxidation state, and the sum of all those oxidation states in a neutral molecule is going to be zero. So for example, we just talked about carbon dioxide. So for example, CO2 there's no charge, it's neutral. Carbon dioxide is not charged. So the entire species has a zero oxidation state. And from that, we can say, hey, what was the oxidation state of the carbon? Oxygen typically is negative two. Now we can just say zero equals X, right, for the carbon, plus two times negative two. And you can solve for the carbon just based on that. In an ion, right, you're going to sum up all the oxidation states. So if you have a polyatomic ion, cation or anion, then the ion, the total oxidation state, is going to be equal to its charge. So for example, the permanganate anion, so MnO4, the whole thing has a negative one charge. So the oxidation state of the entire ion is negative one. I can go ahead and calculate the oxidation state of the manganese in that particular ion because I know that oxygen is typically negative two. Unless it's bonded to itself, it'll be negative two. And if I set that whole thing equal to negative one, I can say negative one equals X plus four times negative two. Solve for X and you know what the oxidation state of the manganese was. How about number four? So in compounds, metals have positive oxidation states. What does that mean? Well, if I take a salt like nickel to chloride, the metal, if you're not sure, the metal is going to be positive. It's going to have a positive oxidation state. In compounds, nonmetals are assigned oxidation states based on the charge their anions typically form. So in that last example, you're probably sitting there going, how did you know that that was positive too? Well, because the metal is gonna take on a positive oxidation state and the magnitude of that oxidation state is gonna be based on what? Well, the whole thing is neutral, so the whole thing equals zero. Chloride typically will take on a negative one oxidation state because chloride has a negative one charge. Chlorine can accept one electron, right, to fill that, that shell, that subshell anyway. And so it's typically going to form chloride, which is negative one. So I used that information to solve for the oxidation state of the nickel in the previous example. I can take another example, mercury two oxide. And I know that oxygen is going to have a negative two oxidation state unless it's bonded to itself. Here it's not. So therefore the mercury, because it's a metal, must be positive two. Because, whoa, sorry, I wrote a 12. <coughs> so the mercury in this particular compound has an oxidation state of positive two because we know that oxygen has an oxidation state of negative two, unless it's bonded to itself. This whole thing doesn't have a charge, so it's zero, right? So we figure out, okay, this mercury is gonna be positive two 
the oxygen is negative 2. Oxygen and hydrogen are two elements that you can count on um, having pretty notoriously having the same oxidation state um, unless they're bond in different types of bonding situations. Like the hydrogen typically has a positive one oxidation state, and the only time it doesn't is when it's bonded to itself or something less electronegative, like a metal, for example, right? Then it would have a negative one oxidation state. Um, oxygen always has a negative two oxidation state unless it's bonded to itself, like molecular oxygen or like a peroxy acid or something like that, or a peroxide. Um, the next one, in molecules, the less electronegative species is going to take on a positive oxidation state. That just makes sense, right? The less electronegative species is the species that's not hanging on to its valence electrons as tightly as the more electronegative species. And as a result, the more electronegative species will be pulling electron density away from the less electronegative species. And so therefore, the less electronegative species is going to take on a positive oxidation state, partial positive charge, remember? So we can do something like um, HF. So we have a covalent bond between the hydrogen and the fluorine, but the fluorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen. And so for this, our hydrogen would have a positive one oxidation state because the fluorine is more electronegative and it would take on a negative one oxidation state. Organic molecules are a little different. Um, I'd like to just share with you um, a nice easy way to estimate the um, oxidation state of certain elements in an organic compound. Organic compounds are carbon containing molecules, right? Or ions. So, um, and if you're going on to take organic chemistry, um, this is a nice little bit to save. So if you're gonna, if you're planning to take Chem 42 or 141, 142, um, you might wanna save these notes because this might come in handy when you start doing actual chemistry um, with these organic molecules and your professor starts talking about the change in the oxidation state for the carbon. So let's just do just like a quick example. Um, we're going to treat these things as if they were ionic compounds, not covalent molecules, right? So then we're going to just split the electrons um, in each of the bonds in a way that allows the more electronegative element to take them both. So if I've got, for example, like um, methylamine, we'll keep this small. I have other examples of these later on in this lecture. We know from drawing our Lewis structures that nitrogen is going to have a lone pair of electrons sitting on it. It would really behoove us to expand this structure. So we're actually looking at what the bonding type actually is instead of, because I know when you're seeing this for the first time, and I, I thought this too, if you're just looking at the, the condensed formula for this particular molecule, it looks like the hydrogens are bonded to the nitrogen, right? Those three hydrogens in the middle there, but it's just by convention that we write it that way. We know that the carbon and the nitrogen are actually bonded together. So what does this really look like? It looks like this. So I've got single covalent bonds between all of these three hydrogens and the carbon, and then the carbon is singly bonded. I'm not going to draw this with proper geometry here because it kind of doesn't matter for what we're doing. The nitrogen has two of those hydrogens bonded to itself, and then it's bonded to the carbon, and then it has a lone pair. So we've expanded the structure. Now we're going to split this up and pretend that this molecule is ionic. And what I mean by that is we're going to divvy up the valence electrons. And what are those? Those are the electrons involved in the bonding. And we're going to divvy them up such that the more electronegative element involved in the bond is going to fully take the electrons. We're pretending that this is ionic. And that's what happens in ionic compounds, right? The more electronegative species is going to take the electrons, and the less electronegative species is going to donate them. So we know that hydrogen and carbon don't have a huge difference in electronegativity, but there is a difference all the same. And we know that hydrogen is less electronegative than carbon. So I'm going to draw all of these without those bonds 
all of these elements. We know that nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon, and we know that nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that this is ionic, and I'm going to give the more electronegative species the electrons. So each bond is going to be considered separately. First, I'm going to start with the carbon-hydrogen bonds. Each one, right, each one of those bonds is a sharing of two electrons, but if this thing was ionic, the carbon, being just a little bit more electronegative than hydrogen, would be hogging those electrons, right? So instead of sharing them, that bond up there is going to put both of those electrons on the carbon. And I'm going to do it for every single one of these covalent bonds. So if this was ionic, the hydrogens would have no electrons, right? They would have totally donated their electron to carbon, and carbon would have taken them. Now, let's look at the nitrogen-hydrogen bonds. We know that nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen, and so each of those covalent bonds is a sharing of two electrons, but if this thing was ionic, the nitrogen would be hogging them. So both of those electrons are going to be given to the nitrogen, and it had a lone pair in the first place. So we have those two. Now what do we do about the two electrons being shared between the carbon and the nitrogen? We know that nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon, and so if this was ionic, the nitrogen would be hogging the electrons. So now we have just taken our covalent organic molecule, and we've pretended that it was ionic. So now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do our calculation. So the oxidation state of any species, any element, right, we'll call that A, is going to be equal to the number of valence electrons in A, whoever that is, right, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen in this case, minus the number of electrons that the species would have if ionic. What does that even mean? Well, so let's do this down here. I'm going to take the oxidation state for hydrogen. I'm going to calculate the oxidation state for the carbon and the oxidation state for the nitrogen. Now, listen, if you've got, say, like in this case, we've got five hydrogens, they are all equivalent, right? So we only need to do one calculation. It's not always going to be like that. Sometimes you'll have, um, you know, an oxygen or a carbon, for example, where you've got to differentiate what carbon or oxygen you're talking about because their electron environment, or in other words, the oxidation state, of that particular species is not going to be the same. You can have, you know, two carbons in the same molecule that are, don't have the same oxidation state. So you'll just have to sort of differentiate them left, right, one, two, color code them, whatever you need to do. This one's easy because all the hydrogens are equivalent. There's only one carbon and only one nitrogen. So let's do this calculation. The valence, number of valence electrons that hydrogen has, right, or its group number is one. <clears throat> The, in this ionic, this pretend ionic setup here, uh, those hydrogens don't have any electrons around them. We've pretended that the thing was ionic, so the number of electrons around those hydrogens, if ionic, would be zero. And so the oxidation state of every hydrogen in this particular molecule would be positive one. For carbon, carbon has four valence electrons, right? It's in group four. We're going to subtract the number of electrons if this thing was ionic. So then you go back to that little pretend ionic structure there, and I see I've got six pink dots. In other words, I've got six electrons around the carbon if this thing was ionic. So I'm going to subtract six, and I'm going to get a negative two. The carbon in methylamine has a pos uh, negative two oxidation state. What about the nitrogen? Nitrogen has five 
valence electrons. And in the structure we've drawn, our pretend ionic structure, that thing has eight pink dots around it. So it's got eight electrons around it if it was ionic. So we're going to subtract eight, and we're going to get a negative three. The oxidation state of the nitrogen in methylamine is negative three. So it just takes a little bit more work, you know, and you've got to pretend this thing is ionic. It's just a little easier to keep track of, of the electrons. I'm going to show you a really uh, kind of a fun example of this um, just a little bit later. We're going to talk about um, oxidizing um, ethanol. So like, you know, when you leave a glass of wine or a bottle of wine open to the atmosphere and it's, it's oxidized, right, by oxygen, molecular oxygen in the atmosphere, um, and you come back to it like a week later and it tastes like vinegar, right? That's, um, vinegar has acetic acid in it. So I want to show you what happens to the oxidation state of one of the carbons when that process happens. And you get to watch um, how it becomes more positive. Okay, so let's get some practice assigning oxidation numbers for um, some molecules and ions. So down here I have a few examples. This first one is the permanganate um, anion. And so um, we talked about this as an example just a little bit ago when we were saying the total um, oxidation state of an ion is going to be equal to its charge, right? So in this particular case, the whole thing has a negative one charge. And so, and we also know that oxygen, we should write this down, oxygen is negative two unless it's bonded to itself. So here, <clears throat> we can count on using negative two for the oxygen. We know that the whole thing is going to be negative one, right? So I'm going to say negative one because the oxidation state of the entire species is going to be equal to the sum of all of the oxidation states. And so we've got two components to this ion. We've got one manganese, right? One mole of manganese and four moles of oxygen. So I don't know what the manganese is, right? Off the top of my head. Well, I kind of do, because I do this example all the time, but when you're figuring it out for the first time, you don't know. It could be anything, right? So I'm going to say if it's the sum of all of its parts, and I let the manganese be x, because I know oxygen is negative 2, then to that x I will add 4, because I see 4 moles right, of the oxygen. And in parentheses, I'm going to put the oxidation state of the oxygen. So in this case, we knew oxygen was negative two, right? And we're talking each oxygen, you guys. So it's, oxygen is not negative eight. It's just in the sum, right? All four of those, each at negative two, right? So each oxygen is negative two. And then X has to be positive seven. The oxidation state of the manganese in that particular species is positive seven. That makes sense? So negative one is the whole charge. It's this thing right here. That's gonna be this thing right here. And that's gonna be equal to the sum of all of its parts. Okay, so next one is the ammonium ion. The ammonium ion has a positive one charge overall, right? And we know that hydrogen is going to be positive 1 unless it's bonded to a less electronegative element. Or itself. Right? If something's bonded to itself, its oxidation state is, uh, the whole molecule is going to be zero, right? So that's something nice to count on, too. 
So now I see that I've got a positive one charge for this whole ion, so plus one. That's going to be the whole thing. And then the sum of its parts, well, we don't know what nitrogen is, so we're going to call it X. And to that, we are going to add four hydrogens, each one in a positive one oxidation state. So the hydrogen we know is positive one, each one of those. The nitrogen, the oxidation state of the nitrogen, right, has to be negative four plus one, so negative three. Okay, let's try a few more. So down here, we're gonna say, we've got cyanide, right, and it has a negative one charge, but now, here's the, the deal. We've been talking about, you know, you can count on hydrogen being positive one unless it's bonded to something less electronegative or itself. You can count on oxygen being negative two unless it's bonded to itself. Now we're looking at an ion where I could have said this, you know, either one of these is X. So now we're going to say, let's let the more electronegative atom assume the negative oxidation number because the more electronegative atom is gonna be the thing that's pulling the electron density toward itself, right? And so the value or the magnitude of that oxidation state is gonna be equal to the charge that that species normally has. So let's let the more electronegative atom assume the negative oxidation state. And let its magnitude equal the value Well, my, um, my screen just went crazy, sorry about that. Uh, equal the value of its typical charge. Okay, what am I talking about? All right, let me show you, it's easier to show you. So, Cyanide has a negative one charge overall, right? So the whole oxidation state for this ion is negative one. Um, we know that the more electronegative atom in this anion is gonna be the nitrogen. So we're gonna let that assume the negative oxidation number and we're going to allow its magnitude to equal the value of its typical charge, meaning nitrogen is the more electronegative atom in this particular ion. Right? Nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. And so we know that nitrogen typically takes on or can take on three electrons, forming the nitride anion, which has a negative three charge. So that's what we're going to use for an oxidation state to try to figure out the oxidation state for the carbon. So that means we don't know what carbon is, and we're going to call it X. <clears throat> and to that, we're going to add one nitrogen and we're assuming a negative three oxidation state. Because the oxidation state, you guys, is just the electron environment, right, around the species. So if nitrogen's more electronegative than carbon, we're going to assume that it's in the negative three oxidation state. That's the charge it typically forms, right, nitrogen. So then the nitrogen has a negative three oxidation state, and in the cyanide anion, the carbon, therefore, has to be positive two. Okay, let's try the next one. So this one, we can just do a calculation here, right? We don't have any explanations. We already know we're gonna let the oxygen be negative two, because we already decided that. So we've got negative three, is the overall oxidation state for the phosphate anion. We have no idea what phosphorus is, but we know that we have four oxygen and it will have a negative two oxidation state. 
right, unless it's bonded to itself. So we know that oxygen is negative 2, and so therefore the phosphorus has to be positive 5. And then for this last one, I wanted to give you one where you come up with um, a fraction for an oxidation state. You know, these oxidation states don't have to be integers. So oxidation numbers. Don't. Have to be integers. So, in this particular molecule, there's no charge, right? So this whole thing is equal to zero. I have no idea what the phosphorus is, but I know I have four of them. So 4x plus, I know that oxygen is typically negative two, and there are seven of those. So the oxidation state for the oxygen is negative two. And the phosphorus in this particular case is going to be positive 7 over 2. All right, 14 divided by 4. Okay. So let's get a little bit more practice with the organic molecules. I have two compounds here, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, where um, we talked about having maybe a bottle of wine or a glass of wine open to the atmosphere, um, and you know could be potentially you know ox the alcohol could be um, potentially oxidized, and you know you come back a, a week later and it tastes like vinegar or whatever you turn it into salad dressing. So I have the alcohol here, ethanol. Um, that's part A. Part B is the acetic acid that we find in vinegar. It's got that sort of like, if you open up a bag of salt and vinegar potato chips, the smell of vinegar, that's what acetic acid smells like. So I have the structure for that molecule. And let's actually look at what happens to this molecule, this ethanol molecule, when it gets oxidized. Like what part of this molecule is actually going to undergo oxidation, which... Um, atom in that molecule is going to experience a different electron environment as a result of the oxidation process. So we're really, we're not looking at the whole reaction. We're just going to look at the ethanol molecule right now, and then we're going to analyze the acetic acid molecule. And this is going to give us a little bit more practice with the organic compounds in assigning oxidation states. The first thing that we want to do um, is to sort of draw the expanded structure for this molecule. And then we're going to pretend like it's ionic, remember? So for part A down here for ethanol, I'm just going to draw out the expanded structure. So I've got a hydrogen that is singly bonded to a carbon, right? So there's three of those, that very first group you see. And then we have another carbon. So this is the CH2. And that carbon is going to be bonded to an oxygen, which is then bonded to a hydrogen. So that's the ethanol molecule right there. So we want to pretend that this thing is ionic. And by that, we mean we're going to look for, in each case where there's a covalent bond, we're going to look at the two atoms that are bonded together. And we see that in those covalent bonds, we are sharing electrons, right? And so... The sharing is not necessarily equal. Some of those atoms are more electronegative than others. We also know that there's not a huge difference in electronegativity between the hydrogen and the carbon, but there is a difference all the same. And we know that carbon is just a little bit more electronegative than hydrogen. So what that means for us is that when we go to draw out the molecule as if it was ionic, I'm going to draw all the same atoms but instead of bonding them covalently, I'm going to leave some empty space. And then what I'm going to do is pretend this thing is ionic. If this thing was ionic, the more electronegative elements would be hogging the electron density, right? Or I should say, instead of hogging, an ionic 
bonding, we have um, a complete donation rate of those valence electrons. So that's what we're that's what we're pretending to do. So we're going to take those little dots, those um, valence electrons that were involved in the covalent bond, and we're now going to give them to the more electronegative element. So for each of those carbon hydrogen bonds, there was a sharing of two electrons. But if this thing was ionic, the carbon, being just a little bit more electronegative than hydrogen, would take both of them, the one that it donated, right, or shared, and hydrogen's valence electron. And so that's going to happen for that bond. It's going to happen for the other single bond, and it's going to happen for the other carbon-hydrogen single bond. The other thing we have to consider here is that these two carbons are bonded together. When you have two elements... Um, that are exactly the same, that are bonded together, we're going to split the valence electrons evenly. So that single bond made up of two electrons is going to be split in half between the two carbons because the carbons are identical. So this carbon will get one, and this carbon will get one. The carbon-hydrogen bonds on the methylene in the middle there are going to be split just like the others. The carbon being just a little bit more electronegative than hydrogen is going to take the electrons in our pretend ionic species. The oxygen now, that single bond between carbon and oxygen, the oxygen is going to be hogging the electrons, right, in that covalent bond. So in our ionic bond, now these are the lone pairs that already just came with the oxygen, those two electrons that are being shared unevenly in that carbon-oxygen bond are going to, in our little fake sort of fantasy ionic model here, they're going to be on the oxygen. And of course, the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so that single bond will result in our ionic model there, the oxygen taking all of the um, valence electrons. So now we're going to calculate the oxidation state for each of the atoms in this particular molecule. Um, and we're going to use our ionic model uh, in order to do that. So what I'm going to do down here is I'm just going to say it's the oxidation state of, I'll put hydrogen first, then I'm going to call the carbon there on the left, the one that's got the CH3, I'll call that carbon on the left, oxidation state of the carbon in the middle, but I'll call it carbon on the right, and then the oxidation state of the oxygen. What we're going to do is we're going to take the number of valence electrons for each of the species, and we're going to subtract the number of electrons around that thing in our sort of fantasy ionic structure. So for hydrogen, hydrogen has one valence electron. And in our little ionic structure there, none of those hydrogens have any electrons around them, so zero. All of our hydrogens are in the plus one oxidation state. The carbon on the left, so you can... Highlight this if you like. This is our carbon on the left here. That's the one I'm talking about. Um, we have four valence electrons for carbon, right? And then in that little structure, I see two, four, six, seven little dots. So seven electrons around that carbon in our pretend ionic structure. That particular carbon has a negative three oxidation state. The carbon on the right, so that's going to be this little guy. So four valence electrons. We're going to subtract. I see two, four, five, right? Electrons in our ionic model. That particular carbon is going to be in the negative one oxidation state. And the oxygen, which usually has six valence electrons, in our ionic model there, there are eight electrons around that oxygen. And so that oxygen is in the negative two oxidation state. So now, the carbon that is going to get oxidized 
when ethanol is oxidized to acetic acid is going to be this carbon. So that carbon is going to get oxidized and we can find out to what oxidation state we're going to bring this carbon when we oxidize ethanol to acetic acid. So what you want to do again is expand your structure. So I'm going to draw again. This helps you to see the bonding, right? Not all of these are going to be single bonds. Like for example, that is a double bond. So there's acetic acid. And we're going to break this up just like we did with the last one so that we've got our atoms sort of floating in the universe, right? And then we're going to treat it as if it's ionic by giving the valence electrons to the more electronegative element. And then we're going to calculate the oxidation state after that. So <clears throat> where are these electrons going? Well, this carbon is in a similar situation, right? Similar electron environment that it was in ethanol. So it's just, it's bonded to three hydrogens and a carbon. So its electron environment is pretty similar. Um, the carbon, though, has changed that carbon on the right. So before it was bonded to two hydrogens. Now it's doubly bonded to an oxygen. And then it's got a single bond to another oxygen. And we know that this oxygen had two lone pairs each. So both of these did. That oxygen up on the top, though, was then is now doubly bonded to the carbon. So all four of the electrons involved in that bond, we're going to go ahead and give them to the oxygen because it's more electronegative. And so now this carbon has a single electron from that, that single bond between it and the other carbon. Those were shared, but it split those electrons evenly. It's bonded to two oxygens, so in both cases the oxygen is going to be hogging the electrons, right, in our ionic model. So now, all of a sudden, that carbon in the middle there, um, the one that was we called the carbon on the right, we sort of highlighted, highlighted it in aqua, it's this thing right here. That thing, all of a sudden, its oxidation state has changed. Its electronic environment has changed, hasn't it? Because now, all of a sudden, I don't have the same number of electrons around it. It's in a totally different electronic environment. Instead of being bonded to two hydrogens and an oxygen, it's doubly bonded to one oxygen and singly bonded to another. And so in our ionic model, it has lost electrons. So it has gotten oxidized. So what is its new oxidation state? So I've got all of the same number of carbons. So this is going to be the carbon on the left. This is the oxidation state of the carbon on the right. And then our oxygens. Um, and our oxygens, we see, have the same number of electrons around them, right? So we don't have our oxygens in different electronic environments, so those are going to be equivalent. So what I mean by that is I don't have to do a separate calculation for both oxygens. So it looks like the hydrogens are in a similar situation as they were before, right? One valence electron. In our ionic model, there aren't any um, electrons around the hydrogen, and so all of those hydrogens are in the plus one oxidation state. The carbon over here on the left we have four valence electrons. Again, we've got two, four, six, seven electrons around that carbon in our ionic model. And so that carbon is still in the negative three oxidation state. The carbon on the right, however, is a little different, right? Now we've got four valence electrons and only one electron around that carbon in this new model in acetic acid. And so 
that carbon is in the positive three oxidation state. The oxygen with six valence electrons, and again, each one of those has eight around it in our ionic model, is in the negative two oxidation state. So what happened? We have oxidized that carbon, right? The molecule got oxidized. We have taken that carbon from the negative one oxidation state to the positive three oxidation state. What does that mean? It means that carbon lost electrons. So that is um, a couple more examples for um, sort of trying to do sort of a crude approximation for um, assigning oxidation numbers to um, atoms in organic compounds. What I'd like to do next is um, try to figure out how we can tell if a redox reaction has occurred at all, right? Because it's pretty easy to tell when, you know, one of your reactants has a charge and, you know, you go over to the product side and all of a sudden it doesn't. But it's a little harder to tell when, say, nothing has charge and you're trying to figure out if an oxidate, a redox reaction happened in the first place. So this is where assigning oxidation numbers to atoms in compounds is going to come in handy for us. So let's see how to tell if a redox reaction has occurred. The first thing we want to do is assign oxidation numbers to every species in the reaction. And sometimes it's easy. You know, sometimes you've got a, a monoatomic ion or sometimes you've got just like a, a metal and, you know, a solid metal. And so you know, that's just an oxidation state of zero or whatever. But sometimes you have molecules, and so it would be great to find out if the oxidation state or the electronic environment, you know, changed for any one particular um, element in um, a molecule or, say, a polyatomic ion. Um, and if there was a, a change in the oxidation state from the reactant side to the product side, then a redox reaction has occurred. We don't know, however, that that redox reaction can occur on its own. We just know that, as written, the redox reaction did occur. In other words, it is a redox reaction. Some redox reactions don't happen naturally or on their own, and I want to talk a little bit about that after this section. Right now, I want to give you a few examples of some reactions, um, and I want to, let's just see. You know, did a redox reaction actually occur? So in our first example, we're going to synthesize some ammonia. This is called the Haber process, and you'll talk about this probably more than you'd like when you get into Chem 32. We're going to take three moles of hydrogen gas, and we're going to allow them to react with one mole of nitrogen gas. We're going to generate two moles of ammonia in the gas phase. We want to know if this is a redox reaction. So none of these guys have any charge associated with them, and so it looks like it might be a little difficult to tell, right? What we'd like to do then is to calculate the oxidation state of each of the species involved in each one of these molecules and see if there was a net change in any of them. And if there was, somebody got oxidized and somebody else got reduced. So let's see. What is the oxidation state of hydrogen in molecular hydrogen? Well, this is our first rule there. Zero, right? We've got something bonded to itself. The oxidation state of the nitrogen and molecular nitrogen is also zero. The big coefficients out front do not mean anything to us, right? That's just based on the balanced chemical equation. I'm looking at what happened to each species when this reaction occurred. So I took hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, and I made some ammonia. Ammonia is a neutral molecule as well. So the overall sum of all of the oxidation states is going to equal zero. I don't know what nitrogen is, and so I'm going to add to it three hydrogens, and I know that hydrogen typically is in the plus one oxidation state, 
When it's not, it's because it's bonded to something that's less electronegative than itself, like some sort of metal. So in this case, what ended up happening was the hydrogen being in the positive one oxidation state was oxidized and the nitrogen now being in the negative three oxidation state was reduced. Do you see that? So let me draw the different colors here. I've taken the hydrogen and I have oxidized it. It lost electrons. We went from zero to plus one. So that has lost electrons. The nitrogen went from zero to negative three. That thing gained electrons. And so yes, this thing, yes, this is a redox reaction. What happened? Well, let's see. The hydrogen was oxidized. and the nitrogen was reduced. And so in other words, you could be asked, what's the oxidizing agent? What's the reducing agent? Well, if the hydrogen was oxidized, right, then it must have been reduced by the other species. And so if the nitrogen was reduced, right, it was reduced by the other species. So. In other words, the hydrogen gas was the reducing agent. And the nitrogen gas was the oxidizing agent. All right, let's do another example that might seem just a little bit um, clearer. Something maybe, it's usually nice when there's charge involved. Hey, can you come get this cat? He's driving me crazy. Okay, so let's see. We've got silver. Ions. And so our ions are going to be, right, it's ionic, right? So it's going to be, um, if we're in water here, this is going to be in the aqueous phase. The ions are soluble in water, right? We have chloride in the aqueous phase. And we've got some silver chloride on the other side. So let's check this out. We know from our rules that the oxidation state of any monoatomic species is simply just its charge, right? So this is nice. Silver's oxidation state, therefore, is positive 1. And this is going to be negative 1. And now over here, we see we have some kind of a compound, but there's no charge on it. So that's a 0, but it is the sum of all of its parts. What happened, though? Well, we know that... <clears throat> If you got a compound um, where you could take the more electronegative element and give it the negative oxidation state to the tune of its typical charge, like, for example, in this case, we don't know necessarily what happened with the silver, but we do know that chlorine, and there's one of them, is going to be the more electronegative element and chloride takes on a negative one charge, right? So chlorine accepts an electron and becomes chloride. We know that that is typically forming the negative one 
um, anion. So we're going to give that um, a, the negative oxidation state because the chlorine is more electronegative. The one comes from its typical expected charge, right? So therefore, the chlorine is in a negative one oxidation state, and the silver is in a positive one oxidation state. Do you see a change in the oxidation state for these species? I don't. This is not a redox reaction. There's no change in the oxidation state of either species. So even though you see charge on the on the reactant side, right, and then no charge on the product side, there's no net change in the oxidation state of either species. So there was no transfer of electrons. Nobody gained electrons, nobody lost electrons, right? Let's do another one. What about... Um, let me think of something. All right, let's pull... Let's pull out some stuff with, some with charge, some without. H plus is just going to be like a source of acid for this reaction. You remember when, if you got to do the, um, um, the copper lab, and at the beginning of this lecture we were talking about how at the beginning of the copper lab, um, you're going to take your copper chunk, Right, So solid copper, just like you see there on the reactant side. And you're going to toss it into a beaker with some nitric acid, concentrated nitric acid. So this is another way to write um, this reaction, what actually happened here. It looks like when you're doing the actual chemistry, it, it looks like the copper is just dissolving, right? Because there it is, copper 2 plus aqueous. Um, but something else is actually happening to that copper. You could probably tell just by looking at it right now. The reason you do this in the fume hood um, is because this particular gas is toxic. Knock your socks off. All right, so liquid. You have to move, honey. No, 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 no. Can you come get this cat? Seriously. Okay, um, so now let's see what happened. Let's analyze each individual part of this reaction. Let's see, we've got copper over here in its native state, right? So copper is zero. Solid copper, the oxidation state is zero. We've got hydrogen, and we've been pretty suggestive about this to draw this in the plus one oxidation state. Nitrate, well, we're going to have to figure this out, right? Because something's going on. We've got negative one for the whole ion. What else do we have here? We don't know what's happening with the nitrogen, so we'll put X for that because we know we can pretty much rely on oxygen to be negative two, and there are three of them. So over here, we know that the oxygen is in the negative two oxidation state, and the nitrogen is actually in the positive five oxidation state, right? So we'd end up with um, X is going to be equal to 6 minus 1. That's where that how that came to be. Um, over here on the product side, we've got the copper, and we know that the oxidation state equals the charge for these monoatomic species. So um, right away, you probably can tell that, yes, this is going to be some sort of redox reaction because the copper went from copper 0 um, to copper positive 2, right? So we've oxidized the copper. But what about over here? So now we've got zero is going to be equal to what? X and then what? One oxygen. Oxygen is negative two unless it's bonded to itself. 
So we've got oxygen is equal to negative 2. What happened to the nitrogen, though? Uh, so the nitrogen is going to end up being positive 2, right? So now you know who got oxidized. Now you just figured out who got reduced. Over here, we've got 0 for the water. Um, let's say 2x for the hydrogen. 1 times negative 2. Hydrogen is positive 1. Oxygen is negative 2. Right? Nothing happened to the hydrogen. Nothing happened to the oxygen. Interestingly enough, because, you know, when you say to somebody, I'm going to oxidize this, and typically in organic chemistry we say, oh, it's pretty easy to spot if we oxidize something. You're just going to add oxygen to it, right? But sometimes that's not the case, and really all we're ever talking about is a transfer of electrons. So how did we tell before when something was oxidized and when something was reduced? Well, we looked for a change in the oxidation state. Here we see that the copper lost electrons. Check that out. It went from copper 0 to copper plus 2. So this lost electrons, which means that the copper was oxidized. And it wasn't the oxygen's fault, right? Look it. It was the nitrogen. This thing gained electrons. So, yes, this is a redox. And what actually happened? Well, the copper was oxidized. And the nitrogen was reduced. So in other words, <coughs> the copper, and you got to be pretty specific, it's that chunk, right, the reactant, if that was oxidized, it was the reducing agent. because the nitrogen got reduced by the copper. But you got to be careful here. The oxidizing agent isn't nitrogen, it's the nitrate anion. You notice that? So the nitrogen, the nitrogen itself was the thing that got reduced, but the copper was actually oxidized by the nitrate anion. So concentrated nitric acid, right, it's an aqueous solution of those ions. So sometimes it's nice to break up those acids sometimes, you know, and, and see what's really going on. I think I got space to squeeze one more in here. This one's pretty interesting. Um, let's do... Um, Let's do photosynthesis. So 6CO2. So these plants are going to take in water and carbon dioxide. And they're going to make some glucose. And some oxygen gas. So let's see if this is a redox reaction. Over here, we've got carbon dioxide, so it's a neutral molecule. Oxidation state adds to zero. I have no idea what's going on with the carbon, but I do know that I have two oxygen, and oxygen is usually in the negative two oxidation state. So this means now that oxygen is in the negative two oxidation state, and the carbon is in the positive four oxidation state. Water is neutral, so the oxidation states add to zero. We've got 2x plus 1 times negative 2. So oxygen is negative 2. Hydrogen is positive 1. 
Great. So now we're going to move over here um, to glucose, which is a neutral molecule, so zero. We know that the hydrogen is typically positive one and oxygen is negative two. What we don't know is too much about that carbon right there, and we know that there are six of them. So we're going to say, now, this is so general, right? I mean, obviously, this is a big molecule. It's not just, this is such a crude approximation, right? This is just, did a redox reaction happen, right? Where specifically on this molecule did this, you know, carbon get either oxidized or reduced, if that happened at all? That, you need to draw out the organic molecule and actually and pull that out, you know, tease that apart. But can you just vaguely say yes or no that this is a redox reaction? Yeah, we can do this. And this is so crude, right? Because these six carbons are not just all piled up like on top of each other. So, but what we can say is that we've got 12 hydrogens all in the positive one oxidation state, six oxygens, right? Negative two oxidation state. So we've got oxygen, negative two, hydrogen, positive one, and the carbon, the oxidation state, is actually zero. So it looks like we went from positive four to zero. It looks like the carbon got reduced. Over here, we have a molecule with just, it's oxygen bonded to itself, right? So we've got zero, and so let's see what happened here. We went from, let's pick this out. Well, I definitely right away can see that the carbon gained electrons. Which carbon on that molecule, that glucose molecule, gained electrons? Well, you got to draw the structure out. But we know that there was a change in the oxidation state for a carbon somewhere. So we know that this is a redox reaction at the very least. So who lost electrons? Oh, you know who did? Oxygen lost electrons. Now, how did I know to grab the oxygen from water and not carbon dioxide? Well, you guys, you can't have carbon dioxide both oxidizing and reducing itself, right? So we've got two things in the pot there, so I'm grabbing that oxygen. Um, all right, and so yes, now in general chemistry, what is your job going to be? It's going to be to recognize that this was a redox reaction at all, right? It's not going to be your job to draw the glucose molecule and point to the carbon, right, <laughs> that gained electrons or the carbon, you know, that got re reduced. So recognizing that it is a redox, that's your job. Yes, this is a redox. What happened? Carbon got reduced. And oxygen got oxidized. But who was responsible? Well, the carbon on carbon dioxide got reduced, and it got reduced by what? The thing that got oxidized. Water is the reducing agent. And Oxygen got oxidized. It's the oxygen on the water molecule. So CO2 must be the oxidizing agent. Okay. So now we, we know how to recognize whether or not something is a redox reaction. Let's talk about, um, do these things happen on their own, right? We know that photosynthesis is not happening on its own without a little light, right? So that's going to um, require a little bit of help. We know that, um, well, we stuck that copper into a beaker with some nitric acid and that thing just went to town. So that thing happened spontaneously. But how do you know if you're not doing the actual chemistry? How can you predict if these things are going to happen naturally? Um, in chemistry, we refer to that as being spontaneous. This process is going to happen naturally without any help from us, right? It's just going to happen on its own. So how do we predict whether or not these things are going to go all by themselves? Do they all 
occur on their own naturally? No, absolutely not. Just because we can write it down doesn't mean, you know, that it's going to happen on its own or naturally. Just because it is a redox reaction doesn't mean it's just going to occur. So some species, and you can think about this a little bit like electronegativity, where some species have a, a stronger pull on electrons than others, right? And so, for example, um, I can write out sort of like a like a nice, easy redox reaction, one that you can recognize right away as, yes, this is a redox reaction. So let me draw this reaction out. I'm going to take some solid copper. I'm going to put it into a beaker with a zinc solution, zinc 2 plus. Do I expect that the copper is going to be oxidized by zinc 2 plus? So do I have essentially a redox reaction written down here? Yes. There was a change in the oxidation state for both the copper and for that zinc ion. So is this a redox reaction? Yes, this is a redox reaction. Yes, redox. Is this going to happen on its own? So spontaneous? So is this reaction gonna happen on its own? And I'm gonna tell you no. Just because you get to write it down doesn't mean it's gonna happen. Sadly, that happens a lot in chemistry. You got this beautiful reaction all written down and then you get into the lab and nothing goes according to what you thought, right? So that happens sometimes. But what's going on here? Well, first of all, there are ways to measure, right, the pull on those electrons. So when we talk about electronegativity, we're talking about some arbitrary assignment, right? This thing is yanking on its valence electrons just a little bit more tightly. Um, and so we have this general trend that we can sort of like assign across the periodic table. Um, but with this stuff right here, these redox reactions, we have measurable values. We can reduce things and then measure the voltage output, right? These things are called reduction potentials, the power to be reduced, the pull that these things have on electrons. So this right here, this E red right here, this is the reduction potential of a species. What's that little weird zero up there, that degree symbol? That just means this is done under standard conditions. Your solution is exactly one molar, right? And you're doing this at one atmosphere of pressure. So there's, a, there's very specific reaction conditions um, that we consider to be standard conditions. And so when we report these values, these voltages, what that little degree symbol means to us is that we were under standard conditions when this stuff was measured. So the nice thing about this is when you get your voltage reading, it gives you kind of an idea, especially when you do a bunch of them, you get an idea for the pull that these species have on electrons or the power of that particular species to be reduced. They are not all the same. So for example, if I were to write down the reduction potentials for the copper 2 plus and the zinc 2 plus ion, they're not going to be the same. In fact, the pull that copper 2 plus, the cupric ion has on electrons is a lot greater than the pull that the zinc 2 plus ion has on electrons. So the reduction potential for, so E red, the pull on the electrons for the cupric ion is greater than the pull on electrons under standard conditions Using two plus. So what this really means is that this particular redox reaction, even though it's a redox reaction, we're trying to say that copper is going to be oxidized by zinc two plus, when in reality, copper two plus is more likely to be reduced by zinc. So what's going on here? Well, this says right here that this has a stronger pull 
on electrons than zinc 2 plus. See that little arrow right there saying this could go in either direction? Well, you know what direction it's more likely to go in? The reverse direction. Let's draw this out. So I'm going to draw out the half reactions complete with their reduction potentials. So when you write out the reduction potentials, you write out the reaction such that it is a reduction, right? So the way that we've drawn our reaction equation, we're saying from left to right, the copper is being oxidized. But to report that reduction potential, I write it out as being reduced. I'm going to not put the physical properties in here just so that we're not clogging things up. Right, but the ions are in solution and the metals, right, are solid. If I add two electrons to this, what do I get? Copper zero. The power behind this is positive 0.34 volts. Zinc, on the other hand, <clears throat> adding two electrons. Right? So reducing that zinc 2 plus to zinc 0, the reduction potential under standard conditions for that is negative 0.76 volts. Not particularly awesome, right? So this is saying so the larger the value, the greater the pull on the electrons. This right here. greater reduction potential the greater potential to be reduced and we do use that terminology it is the standard reduction potential and those values have been measured and there are tables and tables and tables of these things that you can look up. Your book actually gives you what's called an activity series. And qualitatively, that's fine, right? It's not wrong. They're just outlining the power to be oxidized, right, from top to bottom. So the greater, and they're calling it like um, reactivity. So they're saying like the uh, greater reactivity belongs with the species that has the greater power to be oxidized. In other words, the, the more likely the species is to lose electrons would go at the top of that list. It's sort of like the upside down version of a reduction potential table. The problem with the activity series is it's just super vague, right? It's like it requires that you memorize this little chart. And who wants to do that? Nobody. So in other words, if you look up a reduction, a, a table of reduction potentials, you get values and you see that positive 0.34 is greater than negative 0.76. That's meaningful, right? That tells you that copper two plus um, has a greater pull on those two electrons than zinc two plus. If there was a tug of war happening between copper two plus and zinc two plus um, and the two electrons were like the prize, the copper two plus would win in a second, right? Just look at those, those values. Um, with the activity series, it's nice. You can say, okay, well, is this reaction going to be spontaneous? You can say yes or no. But if someone said to you, is this reaction going to be spontaneous? And what would be the voltage output? You'd need a table of reduction potentials and then you could calculate it for them. So let's see how we would do that. Let's take this exact reaction and let's rewrite it down here. So I'm going to take this. Um, just, just as we had it written up above there. So we've already decided that this thing is probably not going to be spontaneous, right? Because we're drawing, um, the copper as being oxidized when we should be drawing the copper as being, um, the cupric ion being reduced according to those data. Let's just see how bad off this thing is. Now, how do you know if, when you do this calculation, how do you make sense out of those data? Well, if you calculate a total cell potential, right, the whole like package there, and you get a negative voltage, then your process is not going to be spontaneous. If you get a positive value, 
it is going to be spontaneous. And the more positive it is, like the bigger the number, the better, right? The more spontaneous. But is it spontaneous at all? Well, if it's greater than one, yes. You know, if the potential for the entire process is going to be a negative value, then no. So let's see. This goes to zinc solid. Okay. So now I am going to break this down and assign my reduction potential data. So I'm going to rewrite everything that I just wrote up there, and I'm going to write it according to the overall reaction equation. So here is my overall reaction equation. Right? So the half reactions with the reduction potential data look like this. So if you take a quick peek, though, at your reaction equation, check that out. It's backwards, right? We'll address that in a second. Zinc, 2 plus, plus 2 electrons. Reduction potential, negative 0.76 volts. <clears throat> okay, now... We are going to rearrange this particular equation. In our reaction equation, the copper is actually being oxidized, not reduced. So therefore, we're going to reverse this process. So we're going to reverse this half reaction. And we're going to change the sign on the potential. So in other words, the oxidation potential is going to be equal to the negative of the reduction potential. We are reversing the reaction, right? And then we look at the next reaction, the next part, the next half of this, right? Because we're talking about a redox reaction. It's two reactions in one, right? One's an oxidation and one's a reduction. So we split the whole thing into two. So each half, right, is its own thing. We know that our reaction equation is trying to tell us that we're going to oxidize the copper. And I went ahead and I looked up reduction potential data, not oxidation potential data. That doesn't, that's not real, right? We measure reduction potentials. But it's cool because if we notice that the reaction is in the reverse, all we have to do is switch the sign. Now, guys, these are not per mole. So don't go thinking that if there's like a big coefficient in front of one of those species, you have to multiply your voltage by that. This is not per mole. This is just, it's 0.34 volts, the end, right? Right, to, to reduce the cupric ion. Okay, so it all the way to copper zero, by the way, because you do, there is a, a reduction potential associated with adding one electron, right? So there are tables and tables of these things, and you just have to look these values up. Um, that second piece, though, that second half reaction, so the zinc 2 plus gaining two electrons going to zinc, in our reaction equation, we see that happening. That's for real. So we get to keep that written as it is. So what are we going to do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this. Is this tedious? Yes. But when you're first learning how to do this, it's kind of worth it. So I'm going to take this just as it is. Negative 0.76 volts. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse that. Because in our actual reaction equation, the copper is being oxidized. That half reaction is showing it being reduced. 
So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to put the copper over here. And on this side, it's copper 2 plus, plus 2 electrons. This is actually negative 0.34 volts, right? Because we just reversed the sign on that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sum them up. Now, when you sum them up, you want to make sure this is where you're going to have to balance the, the equation. This one's balanced already. So there's two electrons, two electrons, and that's good to go. Sometimes it's, it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes you have to multiply by some coefficient to balance the moles. What you won't do is multiply that coefficient by your reduction potentials. But when you redraw your total equation, you want to make sure it looks like the one you got, right? So minus those physical properties, like aqueous and solid and whatever, we have the equation that was given to us. So this right here, is this right here. You just want to make sure that those match before you go summing up your um, total potential. So this is going to be our total potential. So we're adding these together, right? Add that together. What do we have here? Negative 1.10 volts. This right here negative voltage equals not spontaneous. But guess what? The reverse process is spontaneous. And what do I mean by that? So let's check it out. I'm going to do this in a different color so that we can follow that. The reverse process would be if I took copper 2 plus and solid zinc and I reduce the copper and oxidize the zinc. Why? Because copper 2 plus has a greater pull on electrons than zinc 2 plus. And you can probably imagine that the total potential for this is going to be positive 1.10 volts. But we can figure it out. So I'm going to take those half reactions and I'm going to write them. And I'm not going to waste time or space like I did um, in the first place, drawing them out each and every single time. I'm just going to go ahead. We will reverse the zinc reaction, right? The zinc, the the redu or the um the reduction for that, we're just gonna reverse that reaction and change the sign. So E red for this, positive 0.34 volts that was given. Um and for this process, it's zinc going to zinc two plus plus two electrons. But this is the oxidizing potential, which is the negative of that beta that we looked up. So this is negative times negative 0.76 volts. If I add this whole thing up, right, and add this up, what do I have? These two electrons are going to cancel out, and I got copper 2 plus plus zinc goes to copper zero, zinc two plus, and the total is positive 0.76 plus 0.34, 1.10 volts, positive. So this is spontaneous.
can you get a process that is not spontaneous and make it go? Like, what if I wanted to oxidize the copper, right? What if I wanted that process that is not spontaneous? Doesn't Listen, non-spontaneous doesn't mean not happening, right? Not necessarily. We can plug this into an outside power source and force that thing to go if we want, right? Does your, you know, light just turn on by itself? No, you got to flip a switch, right? Sometimes you got to help things out. So yes, we can get this to go. Um, No, it's not going to happen on its own, right? It has a negative potential, a negative voltage. You guys are going to do this in uh, Chem 32. I just wanted to show you another way of looking at this because in your book, what they're going to give you is an activity series, this right here. See this list right here? Look at what they give you. They give you a pile of oxidizing, like we, all of these things are being oxidized. Notice that on the reactant side, you see your metal and on the or gas or whatever. And on the product side, you see that it's lost electrons. So we're looking at these oxidation reactions and they're listing them from, and they're calling them most reactive. Like that could be anything, right? Um, You could look at a table of reduction potentials and say, you know, well, the power to be reduced, that's most reactive, right? I mean, it's all just kind of how you look at it. But your book underneath most reactive is saying, what I mean by that is most easily oxidized. Fine. Strongest tendency to lose electrons at the top here. What do you think that also means? If it's most easily oxidized, isn't it least easily reduced, right? Right. So all the way down to the bottom there, where we see most difficult to oxidize, right? Or the least tendency to lose electrons. Those things are hanging on to their electrons for dear life. And they're also pulling strongly on, say, somebody else's. So if you were to flip this table upside down and say, for example, assign reduction potentials, you'd have actual, like, quantifiable data, like how much stronger does silver plus one pull on that electron then copper plus two pulls on those two electrons copper plus two has a reduction potential of positive 0.34 volts silver plus one has a reduction potential of positive 0.80 volts if you do enough of these you start to memorize these numbers it's kind of sad but I have a couple of examples here to share with you. So if you want to use this chart, and this is the one that's in chapter eight, so I would strongly recommend that you become familiar with this particular chart. I like to have a reduction potential chart because I like to have actual data. The numbers actually have meaning, right? The bigger the positive number, like the more power this thing, um, if you're looking at the reduction potentials, the stronger the pull on the electrons will be. But if I'm just looking at this sort of like qualitative thing where I'm, I've got a list of reactions from top to bottom, I've got from most easily oxidized all the way down to most difficult to oxidize. It's the upside down version of the reduction potentials. But if I was given, say, some, you know, random reaction and I was asked to do a comparison, like, for example, some... Um, qualitative prediction. So say, let's just pick something off this thing. Say I'm going to do, um, I'll pick silver. So I'm going to take silver. What if somebody gave you this reaction? And they asked you, is this thing going to be, um, Spontaneous, And you notice like, okay, it is a redox reaction. <clears throat> right? But is this thing going to happen on its own? So I see I've got silver plus one. Um, and what's happening to the silver? Well, it's gaining electrons, so it's being reduced. What's happening to the aluminum? The aluminum is losing electrons. On that chart... Aluminum, so if I look over here, this is being oxidized. 
and this is being reduced. So is it a redox? Yes. Is it likely to be spontaneous? Well, check it out. On that chart, who is more likely to be oxidized? <clears throat> is it going to be the aluminum or is it going to be the silver? And by silver being oxidized, we're looking at the silver solid, right? So we're asking ourselves, is this process, this forward process as written, is that more likely to happen or is the reverse process more likely to happen? So really what you want to focus on in this chart, because we're looking at, say, oxidation potential, right? We want to look and see, is aluminum solid more likely to lose electrons than solid silver is, right, to lose them? And I look and I see that the aluminum is more likely to be oxidized. It's higher up on the chart. So here it is over here. Than the silver is. So then that leads me to believe that, yes, as written... Meaning, if I had written this in the reverse direction, the answer would be no. This redox reaction is spontaneous. If I had written it in the reverse, where I took the um, aluminum 3 plus ion and I allowed it to intertwine with the silver, right? Because the silver is less likely to be oxidized then that would be a redox reaction, but it would not be spontaneous. What about, let's try one more. So let's make up another. I got, um, let's see. Let's take magnesium. Two plus. And let's mix it up with some lead. What do we get out the other side? So first of all, is this a redox reaction? Yep. Is it likely to happen? Well, let's look. What's being oxidized here? Lead. What's being reduced? Magnesium. Then you look at the chart. Well, let's find these guys. So what do we have here? I see there's the magnesium and there's the lead. So it looks like the magnesium is more likely to be oxidized, right? So solid magnesium is more likely to be oxidized than solid lead, according to this activity series. Again, with zero real data, just sort of a vague idea, is it redox? Yes. But no, as written, this redox reaction is not spontaneous. Why? Because the lead 2 plus has a greater pull on the electrons than the magnesium 2 plus does. So the reverse reaction would actually be spontaneous in this case. So that's how you would do a qualitative analysis. Now, if somebody wanted you to quantify this, right? If I said, well, go ahead and reverse that then, and what would be the voltage? If the reverse is spontaneous, like how spontaneous is it, right? Then you would need a table of reduction potentials, right? And we're gonna save that for uh, Chem 32. Here is a list, so this is not from your textbook, but I, I grabbed one from another textbook where you can actually look these values up, right? So look at lead 2 plus, the reduction potential is negative 0.13, and where's the magnesium? Way down there at negative 2.37. They're both negative, right? So they're not exactly awesome at pulling on electrons, but magnesium 2 plus is far worse than lead 2 plus, right? So you could set up your um, equations, just like we did before, and you could actually calculate it. So there's the lead, right? And there's the magnesium. 
And if you wanted to do a calculation for the other one, what was it again? It was silver and what else? Aluminum. So silver, 0.8. Aluminum down here, negative 1.66. So you could actually do those calculations, and this allows us to quantify the spontaneity. We save that for Chem 32. If you're curious, you can go ahead and do it, but this is Chem 31, so I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. You will get uh, down and dirty with these um, in Chem 32 when you do electrochemistry. But there's the, uh, the table of reduction potentials. And notice, though, if I flip this thing upside down, like this table, and there's a few extras in here. These aren't the, from the same textbook. But if I were to flip this upside down, you would see these, right? Those, all of those right there are on there, that same chart, but just upside down, because now we're talking about reduction potentials, not oxidizing potentials. You can get an oxidizing potential, right, just by changing the sign on the reduction potential, but what are the measurable things in the lab? These reduction potentials. All right. Whew, this is a long one. So I'm going to get this thing processed and uploaded, and then I will get it um, up onto Blackboard for you guys. All right. Well, this is the end of chapter eight, so I'm going to get going on the, um, the videos for chapter nine, and I should have those ready by next week. Um, and I am going to open your quiz for this particular material at the end of this week. So not today, but I will, I'll send out, I'll send up a little flare on Blackboard when I crack open that quiz. All right. Have a great night.